Good evening, everybody. My name is Talia Goes, and I would like to welcome you to the Nebraska Cattlemen Cybersecurity Webinar. Tonight's webinar is co-hosted by Nebraska Cattlemen Insurance Group, powered by FNIC. Um, we have new, numerous presenters tonight, so we ask that you hold your questions until the very end. Um, and then at that time, we'll open up the session for questions. You can utilize the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. Just go ahead and type in your question in that box, um, and then we will answer it live there on the camera by repeating the question and then give you the answer. We appreciate you being here tonight, and hopefully we will provide you with some valuable information. Now I'll turn it over to Jeff Scanlon with FNIC. Thanks, Talia. Yeah. Um, and thanks for all who have logged on this evening. I know that uh, I think they're taping this so that members who aren't able to join us tonight will have uh, access to this uh, via some medium that uh, Talia, I'm sure, will, will fill us in on. Um, I'm Jeff Scanlon. I'm a senior vice president with uh, FNIC, which was formerly known as the, the Harry Coke Company here in Omaha. Um, we're a full Lines insurance broker, uh, just maybe a little bit of background. <clears throat> we actually formed a joint venture with the Nebraska Cattlemen's back in 2019. Um, the, the, the formation was actually to, to form an insurance agency to offer um, a full line insurance products to all the, the members of the association. Uh, we're going to talk about cyber. It's been kind of front and center here for the last two, three years, uh, I think what really brought it front and center for the cattle membership was the recent breach of JBS. And this evening, we're really fortunate to have three subject matter experts. Uh, joining me here in Omaha this, uh, this, a or this afternoon, or late, this, I guess early this evening, is Rachel Johansson. Uh, Rachel is a Director of Information Technology and Compliance for First National Bank of Omaha. Uh, she manages really the internal and external audits and examinations, ensures the adherence of regulatory compliance requirements, and acts as a risk management liaison. Um, and then we also have Anita Klanderud. She is a senior director of communications for First National Bank of Omaha. Um, she handles uh, incident, she's on the incident response team. She's responsible for security awareness and training and uh, third-party risk management information security reviews. Uh, and then joining us remotely is Nicole Limpert. <clears throat> Nicole is actually in California this evening. Um, she's uh, on the road. She, she lives in, in Texas, but uh, is joining us from California. She's a production underwriter for one of the major uh, cyber insurers, Evolve. And, um, she was actually in our office on Tuesday and shared a bunch of information for us, some of which uh, kind of took the wind out of our sails. I mean, just in terms of the number of, of insured cyber losses uh, just in 2020 alone and, and how the average ransom uh, payments or the payments for some of these claims, how high they've, been, they've gone. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing what Nicole has to say and, and just trying to secure the insurance side of things um, if anyone's interested. Another person that's really kind of driving this for us here in Omaha is, is Chris Evans. You don't see Chris Evans, but she's gonna make sure that we stay on track and uh, handle anything that, that, that malfunctions on our end. So we appreciate Chris being here. So um, both Rachel and Anita are attorneys. So uh, they've got a good legal background, um, certainly experts in the cyber field with their positions with the bank. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel and Anita. Okay. Good evening, I'm Anita. And I'm Rachel, and tonight we're going to talk to you about cyber threats and cybersecurity. So as Jeff mentioned, cyber attacks have been increasingly in the news cycle, and they're becoming more and more common and frequent. We're going to start by walking through some of the most popular types of attacks that we see in the news cycle. The first type of attack is what's known as ransomware. This is a type of malicious software that's designed to block access to your computer systems or your files 
until an amount of money is paid. So oftentimes the attacker will make a demand for an amount of money in something like Bitcoin that's untraceable, and they will promise to give you access to a code or a key that will unlock your files. Of course, there's no guarantee that they're going to actually give that to you after you pay the money. A lot of times this will target organizations with smaller security teams or ones that need more immediate access to their information like healthcare, healthcare organizations or government agencies. Also, removing the malicious software from your systems doesn't unlock or allow you to make them operational again. With the COVID-19 pandemic, attacks on remote work tools are also increasing. Companies have had to transition to allow their, their employees to work remotely or to work from home. They've been using collaboration tools like Zoom that we're using here tonight. And Zoom was actually a target of a phishing attack where 50,000 emails were sent out to its users, inviting them to join a meeting that appeared to come from a human resources department. Um, the meeting invitation looked like it was something about a performance review and was designed to kind of instill a sense of panic in the recipient. When the people went out to the meeting, they had to enter in their logon credentials, so their user ID and password, which were then harvested um, by the attackers. Those credentials for Zoom were bought and sold on the dark web for less than fractions of a penny apiece. Another attack that's been in the news lately is the supply chain attack. A supply chain attack is basically when a hacker looks for the weakest link in your supply chain, someone with less security than you. Um, it can happen in any industry. As you know, with JBS, it happened in the food industry. It can happen in the financial sector, oil industry, and also in the government sector. Social engineering has been around for many years, and we're going to talk about phishing via email, text, and phone call. Big breaches in the news and why we're all here tonight, I'm told, is to talk a little bit about JBS. This is a ransomware attack and the hackers forced the shutdown of the company's U.S. beef plant and disrupted operations at poultry and pork plants. In order to not disrupt the supply chain, JBS paid an $11 million ransom in Bitcoin. This attack was perpetrated by a group called R-Evil. It's spelled R-E-V-I-L. This is a ransomware gang out of Russia. They, these cyber criminals, along with many similar groups, are selling their services and marketing them as ransomware as a service. Another type of attack that's been in the news is a colonial pipeline hack, um, where hackers took down the largest fuel pipeline in the United States, causing a shutdown that led to shortages of fuel across the East Coast and a spike in fuel prices. It was believed that this was the result of a single employee's compromised password and that potentially the password that the employee used for work was the same password that they used on a non-work account that was hacked in a different attack. Um, hackers gained entry to the network through a virtual network account remotely and allowed them to access the company's systems. When Colonial received the ransomware demand, they shut down their pipeline for the first time in 57 years. This was also perpetrated by a Russian cybercrime group, this time known as Darkside. Colonial ended up paying the ransomware demand of about $4.4 million. To date, the Justice Department has recovered about half of that amount, or about $2.3 million. Continuing our theme of ransomware attacks, again, this is an attack where a hacker demands payment. They will also threaten to post your information that they've gathered online if you refuse to pay. Manitoulin Transport was a trucking company out of Canada that did refuse to pay when they were hit with a ransomware demand. Their information was posted online to the masses. Luckily, it didn't contain any personal information, but it did contain company information. Ransomware attacks can target companies of all sizes which was true in the instance of the York Animal Hospital, which was a veterinary clinic. The vet was asked to pay an $80,000 ransomware demand, which he did, did not. 
Um, he didn't think he had the money to pay the ransom. He also didn't believe that paying it would give him access back to his patient records. Instead, he resorted to patient records that were a few years old, about four years, and decided to update them manually. With the Kaseya supply chain attack, we're back visiting our friends, are evil again. This time, they got in using an authentication bypass. According to an insider at Kaseya, Kaseya was not practicing good cyber hiding. They weren't patching as they should. They weren't using strong passwords. Um, they had bad code, weak encryption, and that led to um, these hackers taking advantage of a zero-day exploit on their system, which allowed them to bypass their authentication and execute remote commands down the supply chain. SolarWinds was also a supply chain attack, um, possibly due to weak passwords. The, the hackers in this case injected bad code into the software that was sent out in legitimate signed software updates. So all of the supply chain who used SolarWinds thought these were legitimate updates, downloaded it, and the spyware that was attached, the malware, allowed these hackers to spy on companies that use SolarWinds and on down the chain. This even ended up with hackers spying on the U.S. government agencies. They were able to access through SolarWinds, FireEye, which is a security company that supports the government, and then they were able to reach into the U.S. government agencies that way. Now we'll talk to you about some social engineering. Google and Facebook spear phishing scams. Spear phishing is directed at specific people. So in this Google and Facebook spear phishing scam, Specific employees were targeted, and they were sent invoices for goods and services that they actually ordered, but they were directed to pay to a fraudulent account. Deep fake attacks, which you may have heard of on the news, um, are when hackers are able to edit audio and video to make it sound or seem like someone is saying or doing something that they actually are not doing. It's used in film. Um, as you know, Carrie Fisher died during um, when they were filming Star Wars and they were able to uh, use some technology, some artificial intelligence to actually have her perform some of her last scenes. However, when it's used by a hacker, um, for bad purposes, they can um, basically trick people into transferring money into fraudulent accounts. A CEO reported that he received a phone call from his boss, and he said that his boss sounded like, the voice sounded exactly like his boss, even down to the accent and he transferred $243,000 into a fraudulent account. Also, the Microsoft 365 phishing scam was a business email compromise. Some employees received an email with the subject line price revision. When they opened the email, there was no um, document, there wasn't any wording at all, it was empty. Um, except for an attachment that appeared to be an Excel spreadsheet. When they opened it, it was an HTML document, which took them to a website and popped up a message saying that they were logged out of Office 365 and asking them to log in. When they entered their credentials, the credentials were harvested. The Google Drive collaboration scam relies on and leverages the legitimacy of Google. The fraudster goes out and creates a document, a Google Doc, and invites a target to collaborate by tagging them in a comment where they've already posted malicious links within the document. Google then sends the target an email 
notifying them that the document is asking for their input. So the email looks like it's coming from Google. It is actually coming from Google and oftentimes will bypass normal email spam filters. When the target goes to the document, they see the comments asking for their input and click on the malicious link that harvests their user credentials. In a whaling attack, this type of attack targets a senior level executive at a company such as a CEO or a CFO in an effort to get them to wire money or transfer funds. We saw this in the big case of a Belgian bank who was targeted to the tune of $75 million. A delivery company smishing scam is a type of phishing scam that's perpetrated via text message. You may have actually gotten some of these text messages. They appear to be coming from delivery companies like UPS or FedEx with a link asking you to claim your package delivery. When you click on the link, you're requested to enter some personal information or credit card information in order to get access to your delivery details. That information is then gathered by attackers. Now we're going to talk a little bit about phishing emails and text messages and how to identify them. It used to be fairly easy to identify a phishing email with all of the misspellings. Um, it's directed to just a general audience. It's not directed to a specific person. And it just didn't really seem legitimate. Today, unfortunately, the hackers have become very much experts in making these phishing emails look legitimate. They do a lot of research. They go on LinkedIn, Facebook, other social media platforms, and they see who your friends are, who your contacts are, who, who your chain of command is at work, who other workers at your place of work are and they will use their names um, to try to target you. So in this case, a woman named Caitlin received an email from Liam Sparks. Perhaps they found um, a vendor list and that this company uses XYZ supplies. So it could be possible that she's getting an email from Liam Sparks. If you hover over the link in the email, um, to Liam Sparks' email address, it should show up and it should be an email address that is legitimate. Um, but if you look at it and you see things like maybe instead of an A, they use an O in Liam, or maybe they use an exclamation point instead of the I. Um, there might be some sign like that that you can look for in his name or in his email address. Uh, the intent is oftentimes to get you to take action before you can really think about it or before you can really look through and scrutinize the email. So it's always a good idea if you get an email um, that you're not expecting or from a person that you haven't talked to for a while, or in this case, an invoice that maybe isn't waiting for payment. Um, you need to just take a step back, calm down, and really look at the email. And when all else fails, call the person. If you know the person, call them at a number that you know. Don't call the number on the email because you'll probably get the hacker. Um, and just ask if they sent that to you. Um, also, if you notice at the bottom, we have a section called payload, and that is a PDF document, but it can also be a link. In the small black box, that is supposed to represent like a text message. You can't trust phone numbers anymore to identify where the text message is coming from because phone numbers can be spoofed. Um, you probably get lots of calls that appear to be coming from the United States, coming from Nebraska, towns in Nebraska you've never heard of before. Um, I get those on a daily basis. Sometimes when the hackers are spoofing a phone call or a phone number, they'll miss a digit and it will say where they're really coming from. Uh, Romania, 
is what I get quite often. Um, or it'll just say U.S. Um, so it's interesting when they mess it up a little bit. But um, same type of scrutiny should be used for the text messages. If you're not expecting it, if you don't have an outstanding vehicle tax reimbursement, um, probably a good idea to just ignore that. Definitely don't click on the link. And if you think that you might, you can call the tax office at a number that you find on your own. There are a number of safeguards that banks and financial institutions will often implement on behalf of their customers or that you can request they implement in certain scenarios, especially when it comes to wire transfers and money movements. At First National, we do things like an assigned wire transfer limit where you would set a specified amount for an individual in your company that they can transact on. So any amount of money that's over that limit, they wouldn't be able to perform that transaction. A unique PIN can also be assigned that adds an extra layer of identity verification and authorization um, to an individual and makes an account more difficult and less susceptible to compromise. Posting to a designated customer account or controlled processing account is essentially a list of accounts that the bank has on file that they expect the wire transfers or funds transfers to be going to. This helps prevent any money going to a fraudulent account that may not be on that list. Alternate validation can also be used. <clears throat> In the case of non-in-person wire transfers, the bank might do something like a callback verification where we would call a number that we have on file already for your company to make sure the money transfer request is legitimate and coming from your organization. Additional approval can be required for non-in-person wire transfers, such as authorizing the request from a second layer of approval or a second person in your company before the money goes out the door. Banks oftentimes won't process wire transfers or funds transfers for non-customers. And what are some steps that you can take to prevent a compromise? You should create a data recovery process. Um, I know that it's been reported in the news a lot lately about different entities paying the ransom um, to unlock ransomware. However, um, it is best if you can restore from backup, but your backup isn't any good if you can't restore it and you should be testing it to make sure that it can be restored. Um, put policies in place so that everyone on your network knows what their responsibility is and knows how to protect your network. Don't use the same password across multiple pl platforms and use a strong password. Regular Regular off-site backups should be completed at least daily, weekly, and monthly, and this will reduce the likelihood of the backups also becoming infected. Hackers gain access to systems when they're not adequately protected, and the best way to know if you're vulnerable is to run vulnerability scans and penetration testing. You can, if you don't have the um, people with the expertise to do these scans and tests on site, you can hire companies that can do that for you. Educate your staff and your family if you're a small business and sharing your home network with your family. Um, we normally recommend that you use a separate computer that is only used to access your financial accounts. You should not access email and you should not surf the web on that computer. And you shouldn't let anyone else use it except for people who are accessing your financial accounts. That's the safest way to protect your credentials. Um, and know where your data is um, because if you have, if you're sending data to vendors and um, that particular vendor is breached, you want to be able to stop sending the data right away. And if they're a critical vendor to one of your processes, 
then you want to make sure that you have a backup vendor and you can start using your backup vendor as soon as possible. Use multi-factor authentication wherever possible. Um, so it's a popular topic where we're from in banking um, and a lot of us have heard about it, but you may not be familiar with it. It's something in addition to just your um, login name and password. So at the bank, we use a system called Okta, and that system will either text you a passcode or it will ask you to, um, if you want to send a push verification, and then you just, um, from your phone, say, yes, it's me, um, after you enter your credentials. Um, or it might send you an email if you choose that. But that's just an additional layer of authentication that helps protect your account. Other financial institutions offer different kinds of MFA, but also um, Facebook offers it, uh, and so does LinkedIn. Limit the information that you share whenever possible. Uh, there's a funny commercial on TV right now where a woman is shopping online and she yells out to someone else in her house, is it normal for uh, them to request my social security number when I'm buying socks? Of course not. Um, take advantage of any controls and protections offered by your, your vendors and your financial institutions. Um, Rachel ran through um, some offerings uh, some protections that the bank offers for wire transfers. Keep your applications and your operating systems up to date on patching and have a plan in place in case you are breached. Your cyber insurance carriers can help you with this. They have pre-vetted lists of forensic specialists who can investigate a breach that happens at your location and make sure that your network is clean before you resume operations. They also have pre-vetted law firms and breach coaches to help keep your information under attorney-client privilege and practice that plan as much as possible. Hopefully you don't become the victim of any of the types of cyber attacks that we've covered here today. But if you are or you think you are, don't panic. There are some steps that you can take to move forward and hopefully get your systems operational again. Number one would be to stop using a computer that you think might be infected or compromised. So don't open any applications. Don't put any more data onto that computer. You can also get the help of a security company who specializes in restoring systems after they've been infected um, to an operational state. You should change your passwords on any of your accounts, including your email that you access from the compromised computer. And if you use the same password on any other accounts, you should change those as well. But you shouldn't use the same password, but make sure you change them all. If you're going about changing your passwords, change them from a different device other than the compromised computer, change them from your phone or from a different PC. If you think you've been impacted by ransomware, the quickest way is to restore from backup, and we touched on the importance of backups earlier, but make sure that you've had the help of a security professional before you try to restore your backup. You don't want to restore them on a system that's still infected or potentially corrupt your backups and not have that information either. You can contact your financial institutions where you have your accounts if you're worried about your financial information being compromised, and you can put place fraud alerts on your accounts or holds um, on your debit cards or credit cards. You can watch your transaction activity by contacting one of the three major credit bureaus to obtain your credit reports, and so that would be Experian, TransUnion, or Equifax. You may need to consider filing a police report, and you can use law enforcement as a resource in these types of situations. The FBI is especially interested in ransomware attacks as they're becoming more prevalent. You should document everything, so maintain a written document of all the steps that you've taken and the actions to sufficient detail that you can share with law enforcement and keep as a record for your business. 
challenges working with vendors. Um, at the bank, um, we review vendors for cybersecurity, and it's important to us. Um, we make sure and ask them for information that is pertinent to our relationship with them and matches the risk that we feel we have with them. So if it's a, a vendor that gets a lot of sensitive information, we're going to review them on an at least an annual basis. Uh, and we're going to ask for um, a questionnaire that they fill out. Um, we have a questionnaire in the financial industry uh, that's called a SIG. It's a standard information gathering tool. That's what we use, but you can write your own. Um, we also ask for audit documentation of their security program. In our case, we ask for an SSAE or a SOC, SOC. We also ask for a penetration test if it's applicable, and we might ask for certain certifications like payment card industry certification um, or an ISO certification. If you Become aware of a breach at your vendor. It, it's important to know what information is there as stated before. Um, for example, if you're using a data aggregator such as Mint, um, Mint is a budgeting tool and um, the way you use it is you give them the username and password to any account that you want them to put into your budget and track your spending. And while it creates a lot of uh, convenience, it's also very risky. If that one vendor is breached, then multiple accounts of yours credentials are also breached. So you need to rush and change all of your passwords before the hackers beat you to it. Hopefully we've provided you with some helpful tips and tricks tonight that you can implement either at your company or just in your day-to-day -day life. Um, we've also made some resources available through the articles that we've produced um, from the bank. So take a look at those. Another great resource for you that's online 24 by seven is our security center at www.fmbo.com backslash security hyphen center. Anita and I are also available for any questions. We've had our contact information on the presentation and webinar, and I know there's going to be a Q&A session later in this presentation. Great. Thank you very much, Anita and Rachel. Some very good practical information. Um, so we're going to switch gears. You know, you still may have uh, maybe a sense of insecurity with your own systems, whether it's personal or at your business, and you may need to secure insurance. So Nicole is gonna talk about some of the underwriting aspects of securing cyber insurance. Again, um, Nicole is a production underwriter with Evolve. Evolve is a, is a company that just specializes in cyber insurance. And so while securing an insurance policy for cyber coverage, there are other motives to, uh, to secure cyber insurance. And, and I think Rachel or Anita have already mentioned it, and that's just to have a coach once you've been, um, once you've been infected with a virus. Is, you know, what are your next steps? So uh, certainly insurance carriers specializing in, in cyber uh, coverages have those capabilities. So Nicole, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, walk through um, with everyone, just some of the things that, that you look at from an underwriting perspective. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me today, guys. And that was some really good information that was provided. Um, what I want to talk to you guys about today is the way that these attacks interact with insurance policies. I know um, insurance, everybody's favorite thing here, but they can be very, very important when these attacks come through. Um, many times cyber losses, they're felt very immediately and they can be very large. And a lot of businesses may not have the cash 
on hand to sustain those. So um, as Jeff had mentioned, Evolve is a cyber specialist market. So cyber insurance is all that we do. Uh, it's pretty unique in the insurance space to just have one line of coverage, but cyber is definitely very different than any other lines of insurance that are out there. Um, it really is there to protect your intangible assets, which ultimately are your data and your bank accounts. Um, in terms of the way that cyber policies are set up, there are two different sides to them. You have first party coverages. These are essentially the immediate costs that a business has to face when a cyber attack comes through. Um, you can think of these as those initial response, you know, when you're calling in, um, getting forensics IT specialists within your system, doing the hacker negotiations, uh, maybe getting some legal advice if any sensitive data was accessed any lost income that the business experienced while being down, you know, from not being able to access your system um, and then reputational harm after the attack occurs, you know, did you lose some customers because of the attack? Maybe you missed a couple of deadlines while being down or you had to notify customers that you lost their information. Um, and then lastly, the cyber crime component, reimbursing for those fraudulent transfers that occur when a hacker poses as one of your trusted third parties requesting that payment. The other side to cyber policies is the liability side. This is um, will kick in whenever there's a lawsuit because of a cyber attack. Just know that the majority of costs that we see when cyber attacks occur, they really start on the first party side, which is where many people um, don't really realize that uh, certain costs can be covered with cyber insurance policies. Um, this was kind of already touched on, but the top two attacks that we see are ransom and fraudulent transfers. They occur to every single industry because they happen through email addresses and bank accounts. And I can pretty much guarantee everyone on this call here has an email address and a bank account. So you have an exposure to the top two most frequently occurring attacks. Now there are attacks that have plagued the agriculture industry. Um, you know, we have talked about many of these today. There was a large egg supplier that was shut down by a ransomware attack. They had information on their employees, their inventory, expense reports, doc schedules, et cetera, all posted on the dark web available for sale. And we had a group of food distributors that were also taken down by a ransomware attack. The hackers were requesting seven and a half million dollars. And then of course, um, the JBS attack where they ended up paying the hackers $11 million to regain access to their system and keep their data private. Now, not only do, the, do those ransomware attacks occur, also those fraudulent transfer claims as well. Um, this one here was a $17.2 million transfer to a hacker's bank account where um, hackers had actually posed as the CEO of the company they requested to the controller that um, funds were sent out to a new bank account. They were working through an acquisition. The controller didn't really notice anything wrong with the request and uh, $17.2 million out the door. Um, I thought this was a cute little quote here on the bottom right. CrowdStrike, this is one of the leading uh, cybersecurity vendors. They're one of our panel providers that we partner with. Um, one of the founders had stated that the one message I try to leave people with, including farmers, is that when it comes to hackers and scammers, we are all Kim Kardashians. We all have what they want. It is really not how important your data is to the hackers. It's how important your data is to yourself. So some things that can be picked up on cyber insurance policies are that initial incident response, you know, the business interruption, the lost income from being down. Um, this can also be reimbursed if one of your dependent vendors goes down from a cyber attack as well. So let's say that, um, you know, the JBS packing plant was one of your vendors and you lost some income because they had a cyber event. Uh, well, that can be reimbursed by a cyber policy, including all of the other coverages that you see here on the screen. Now, some of the cybersecurity initiatives that we are looking for um, to price out cyber insurance policies um, one of the main rating bases is that we use is actually revenue that helps us to determine what that business interruption could look like. Uh, if you guys are ever curious on, you know, if you're you know, curious about cyber insurance in the first place, but also what limits you might want to purchase, how much coverage you want, 
Um, see how much income you would lose if you were down for one day, two days, you know, maybe a week, two weeks, three weeks, and kind of play around with those numbers and see what those losses look like. And then from there, obviously, everyone has different risk profiles. You can kind of determine what you would be most comfortable with. Now, the two main things that we're looking for from an underwriting perspective are multi-factor authentication, which was discussed here today. Um, it's one of the easiest ways to protect against hack attacks because it is usually free to turn on. You just have to dive a bit deeper into your email settings. And then obviously hackers are doing these uh, attacks remotely. So when they are trying to log into your system, you get a little text and you can basically stop them in their tracks. The second thing we are looking for is offline backups, because if you have a backup version that is disconnected from the system, it is essentially safeguarded against that ransomware virus being spread. Um, then when the attack occurs, we're able to just wipe the system and reboot from that backup. We don't even have to do the hacker negotiations. So those are two of the biggest things we look for. Some other things are listed down here as well. I would say if you are a company that has revenues north of $50 million, these are some basic securities that you really should look into having put in place because that from our claims data um, is really the threshold where we see these cyber payouts be really large and they can be really gnarly. Um, so definitely look into these endpoint detection and response solutions. Um, this basically will monitor and stop any incoming virus from coming in any of your endpoints. Employee trainings are very, very important because the number one cause of hack attacks is just human error. It's just someone clicking on a link they shouldn't have or sending payment to somewhere they shouldn't have. And it costs the business thousands, if not millions of dollars. Um, the last two were already discussed, so I'm not going to re-review those, but um, definitely make sure that you have these in place. Um, like I said, especially if you are north of that $50 million revenue threshold. So um, that's what I have for you guys today. Uh, summary, every single business has an exposure because everyone has an email address and a bank account. And it really just comes down to that human error aspect. It's kind of cheesy to say it's not if an attack happens, it's when, but it really is true. And the only way to make sure that these attacks are not detrimental to your business is to have the good controls on the front end and a good cyber policy sitting behind you on the back end to make these attacks a quick fix because they're going to happen. It's just whether you know we're able to get you back up and running within 24 hours or you're down for multiple weeks and start incurring those big, big losses. Uh, my contact information is here on the screen as well. And I believe the um, PowerPoint may be sent out afterwards too. So if anyone ever has any questions about cyber insurance or wants to um, inquire about a policy, reach out to Jeff and he can loop me in and then um, I'm happy to help from there. Thank you very much. Very good information, very good uh, insight on what's needed in order to secure cyber insurance. Um, so that that really wraps up the presentation piece of this. A, a couple of comments, uh, maybe closing comments before we turn it back to Talia. Um, you know, no one's immune from a cyber attack. Uh, I, I gave a presentation oh, a little over two years ago to a, <clears throat> at a chamber event. One of the questions I asked in the room, I, I suppose there was 75, 100 people in the room. I asked how many people in the last 12 months had um, had a had a text or had a had a phone call or maybe an attempt at a breach, and nearly everyone in the room raised their hand, which I was surprised. Uh, maybe not so much today. Uh, even for me personally, I get notified by our HR department here on Thursday last Thursday that said that um, that the uh, that I was trying to secure unemployment insurance. We had a letter from the Department of Labor. And I had a follow-up letter from the Department of Labor in my uh, in my mail yesterday. So just it, it, it's it's prevalent everywhere. So um, you know, as Mill Cole said, Evolve is an insurance company that specializes in cyber insurance. And so maybe a plug for the NCIG, the joint venture um, partnership that we have with the association. First of all, we're a full lines agency. And if you feel the need to secure insurance, uh, Jeff Willis, who many I know have met, is a director of the NCIG. And Jeff can be reached at 402-861-7045. Uh, 
or you can email Jeff at ncig at necattleman.org, or you can just access the Nebraska Cattlemen as well. Um, so again, the NCIG, not only do they offer cyber products, cyber insurance, but it's again, a full line agency uh, for property casualty, farm and ranch, livestock mortality, uh, aircraft, workers comp, we have uh, health benefits. In fact, you may uh, keep an eye out. We'll have a um, uh, Scott Morris who who handles the health insurance products for NCIG is having has an article that'll be in the Nebraska Cattleman Insider. So you might keep an eye out for that in a in an upcoming um, uh, magazine. Um, and then, of course, you know, if you have an interest in in securing this the, the cyber insurance. Uh, we'd ask you to contact Jeff Willis. So um, I guess at this point, we'll turn it back to Talia. Uh, and if we'd be, uh, we'd be interested in entertaining any questions that you might have. Okay, it looks like there is a question. Um, if I have granted an API to another company to share data, how can these arrangements be protected? So at the bank, um, we make sure that we test the API um, and make sure that the coding is secure. Um, that is one step that you can take. Um, I can also uh, look into that further for you. Uh, we're more on the compliance and incident response and that side. So uh, deep technical questions like that, um, I would refer you to a, a technology expert. So we, uh, I see that's from Dwayne. So we'll, uh, we'll circle back and, and get back personally with Dwayne for that. For that for a response. Yeah, thank you for that question. I may also just ask a question to pull not to put you on the spot. Whenever you were here Tuesday, you had mentioned a website that uh, we all kind of immediately checked to see if the, you know if your system, if your personal email had been hacked or or your phone had been hacked. Would you mind sharing that website again? Yeah, definitely. I uh, actually just put it in the chat for everyone. So if you go to this website, you can actually see if your information has been a part of any third party breach and it could possibly be bought or sold on the dark web currently. So um, it's definitely scary stuff, but I wouldn't be too alarmed. I would say just about everyone has been a part of these breaches. Um, something that you should do, though, if you are a part of many is just make sure you know what to look out for and those fake phishing emails, which is really the number one way that ransomware attacks start. And then also ensure that you're updating and changing your passwords frequently, because passwords are one thing that is usually released in those breaches. And so if you're using the same password across multiple accounts, then hackers can see that and just plug and play the information in. they don't actually have to even trick you anymore. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I see no more questions that have popped up. Um, I guess we'll take one more pass for anyone that, who might have a question. And if there are none, uh, tell you, we'll turn it back to you. Okay, so we just wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. This webinar was recorded um, and it will be posted on our website at www.nebraskacattlemen.org along with all the speakers information. Um, you will also receive a follow up email next week, probably early next week in regards to the webinar tonight. So thank you again, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. We have one more question that's popped up uh, from Dwayne. It says, what about some of the lock boxes for passwords? Um, yeah, as long as you do your research and make sure that it is a well-known um, lockbox for passwords, um, I can't think of the name of one off the top of my head, 
but um, you know, do your research, ask around, um, and you know, it, it's it's hard to remember all your passwords if you don't use something like that. Hope that answered your question, Dwayne. All right, Talia, I'll let you I'll let you close out. <laughs> All right. Again, um, this webinar will be found can be found on our website. It'll be posted tomorrow. That's www.nebraskacattlemen.org. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.